There are benches. Everything is nice and symmetrical. They sidewalks cross each other in just the right places. Even the benches are bolted down. So they stay in just the right. Only Presbyterians would bolt down benches. You know, decency and order. Decency and order. Beautiful. And late in the afternoons, especially in the spring and the fall, the students go out and they play frisbee golf on the quad or sometimes wiffle ball. It's a wonderful setting. It's an idyllic kind of setting. Well, 10 years ago, a group of students at the school placed a cross at the center, right at the center of the quad. And this cross was not a nice, neat, shiny, gold, or silver cross. Rather, it was a really large, rough, wooden cross. The year was 2003. It was the very beginning of the Iraq War. And the students felt they needed to do something. So they decided to set up a place for vigils and prayers, and yes, also resistance. And they had heard that somewhere on this Presbyterian campus, there was an old cross, so they went looking for it. I'm embarrassed to tell you where they found it. They found the cross up in a storage room on the third floor of the administration building. That's where the cross was. It was old, it was worn, the stand was in horrible shape, so the cross was always sort of leaning to the side, it was cockeyed. But the students carried that huge old cockeyed cross out into the center of the quad, set it up right in the middle of everything. They offered the power of the cross as a challenge to the power of the U.S. military. They proclaimed the cross as an alternative to the policy of shock and awe. And it was really foolish, if you think about it. But there was something else that was odd about the cross in the center of the quad. It not only seemed foolish in relation to the war, it also seemed foolish in the middle of the campus. It was out of place. It was an eyesore. It disturbed the beautiful symmetry and peacefulness and order of the campus. It got in the way. It interrupted business as usual. You try to walk across the walk across the quad to get a cup of coffee, and there was the cross just staring at you. You sort of turn your head, walk by it like you turn your head sometimes with a homeless person. I just don't want to deal with the cross right now. And it's tough to play wiffle ball, isn't it? With a big cross out of the right field. And do you really want to hit the cross with your frisbee? Some students even complain about that cross in the middle of the quad. How dare a small group of students take it upon themselves to disrupt all of our activities in this way. After several weeks, however, the weather took its toll on that old cross. The rickety stand gave out. That old wooden cross fell to the ground even as the war in Iraq raged on. The students all the way, I don't even know where they put it. And everything got back to normal. Over those few weeks, I think that group of students invited all of us to a profound understanding of the cross and Jesus' crucifixion. At the center of the campus, the cross was not a sacrifice or a word of forgiveness or even a moral example. Nor was the cross a kind of glorification of suffering or a call passively to endure abuse or violence. Rather, the cross at the center of the campus was an interruption. It was an interruption that exposed the world's assumptions about power and unsettled the symmetries and securities of the campus, including the nice theological symmetries and securities by which we often seek to control and manage the cross. The cross was an interruption that recalled the disruptive way of Jesus, who in love challenged the powers of domination and violence and death, even though it cost him his life. But there was more. The cross at the center of the quad also stood as a reminder of 
the hiddenness, the hiddenness of Christ's power in the world, the seeming folly of that power, the paradoxical character of this power that the world perceives as weakness. The cross interrupted and unsettled, exposing the reality and the consequences of war, but it also created a paradoxical space in the quad in which people had to discern. They had to discern in the seemingly powerless death of Jesus, an alternative to the powers of death that dominate the world. People had to discern wisdom and power in the scandalously foolish cockeyed cross at the center of the quad. And even on that seminary campus, not everyone did. The cross at the center of the quad is, I think, the cross Paul proclaims in 1 Corinthians. Indeed, Paul's preaching is even more outlandish, much more outlandish, than the act of the seminary students. In the midst of the Roman Empire, which had its own shock and awe tactics, including crucifixion, to support, to enforce the Pax Roman, in the midst of the empire, Paul proclaims the cross. In the midst of a culture based on wisdom and power and honor, those were the building blocks, right in the midst of that culture, Paul runs around preaching the crucified Christ. Theologically, it was unimaginable that the Messiah, Christ, would be crucified. Philosophically, it was unthinkable that the divine could hang in the flesh on a cross. Politically, it was inconceivable that the Messiah would liberate Israel from crucifixion by the very empire from which liberation was expected. And culturally, it was impossible that one shame on the cross should be honored as the Christ. Messiah, cross, Messiah, his fiction. These were incommensurable realities. Neither the theological, nor philosophical, nor political, nor cultural imagination could even entertain such an idea. It was a shocking, even blasphemous paradox. It was, as Paul himself says, Foolishness. Indeed, according to some scholars, the translation foolishness is actually much contained. It was, in fact, madness. And the word for foolishness is the word from which we get moron. It was moronic what Paul was doing. For Paul, too, the cross is an interruption. And now many New Testament scholars are arguing that the cross, in fact, is an apocalyptic, an apocalyptic interruption. It's an invasion of the old age, the old myths, the old conventions, the old rationalities of the world. It's an invasion of that old age by the new. And as such an invasion, an interruption, the cross unmasks powers of the old age for what they are, not the divine regions of life as they claim to be, but rather the agents of death. And the cross inaugurates the new age, or the new creation, right there in the midst of the old. And in interrupting the old age with the new, the cross creates a space, a space where we may be liberated from the powers of death, both to resist their deadly ways and to begin living even now in the new creation. As a result of this apocalyptic interruption, J. Lewis Martin, a New Testament scholar in particular, has stated that Christians stand at the juncture of the ages. We stand at the juncture of the ages, or the turn, the turn, of the ages. We stand in between in a kind of liminal space or a, a threshold space 
where the two ages overlap, like the threshold space between two rooms, where the two ages overlap. The old is passing away, but the new has not yet fully come. And there's conflict, and there's struggle in that threshold space. And that space is also, like all liminal spaces, a space of movement. Always movement from one place to the other. In this case, movement from the old age to the new. A movement of being on the way that is never complete until the final coming of the new creation. Moreover, in this space, people have to learn to look, to discern the wisdom and power of God and the foolishness and weakness of the cross. In the midst of the old age, the power and wisdom of the cross often remain hidden, usually remain hidden. Because the old age continues its aggressive ways, the cross still appears as weakness and folly. In the threshold space, people of faith must discern with what, again, J. Lewis Martin calls a kind of bifocal vision. Bifocal vision. Believers must perceive the unmasked old age for what it is. The enslaving way of death opposed to the way of God. And we must simultaneously, simultaneously perceive the inbreaking new age as the liberating, life giving way of the future. Indeed, the interruption of the cross. Paul makes clear in the text we read, creates a crisis of perception, a crisis of perception, dividing those who discern with bifocal vision from those who continue to perceive according to the ways of the old age. What I'm trying to talk about here is apocalyptic imagination. Apocalyptic is not simply a literary genre. It's the main thing uh, that you're probably noticing. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. Apocalyptic is not simply a literary genre with wild, spectacular imagery and trips to heaven guided by angels and visions of the future. There is an apocalyptic genre, but apocalyptic is not limited to that. Rather, apocalyptic is a kind of theological orientation and perception and imagination that crosses many genres in scripture. This apocalyptic imagination is shaped by a theology of interruption. To borrow a phrase from the Dutch theologian Liefen Buffa. That's the best a guy from Arkansas can do at pronouncing that name. <laughs> I wrote a Dutch friend, how do you pronounce that name? This is the best I can do. He speaks of a theology of interruption. Apocalyptic imagination lives in that space where the new age interrupts the old. It lives in that threshold space, that both and space in which the new age has broken in, but in which the old age continuously and aggressively exists in tension with the new. Apocalyptic imagination lives in that space in which the new has interrupted the old, but not even remotely overcome it. And in this space, apocalyptic imagination focuses with bifocal vision or bifocal discernment. Such discernment simultaneously perceives the old age powers of death continuing their work in the world, never avoiding the horrors that continue because of the old age. But at the same time, it simultaneously discerns the new age, which has disrupted the old, offering life, but often in ways that remain hidden. William Stringfellow, the Episcopal lay theologian and radical Christian, put it this way, this kind of discernment involves comprehending the remarkable and common happenings.
receiving the saga of salvation right in the midst of the era of the fall. It enables one to see portents of death where others find progress or success. But simultaneously, to behold tokens of the reality of the resurrection where others are consigned to confusion and despair. By focal vision, apocalyptic imagination. In fact, this kind of perception is at the heart of the word apocalypse itself. The Greek term is apocalypto. Many of you, maybe most of you know that. It means to reveal. To reveal. That's where we get the title of the book, Revelation, the Apocalypse. Revelation. That's what apocalypse means. It's an unveiling, an uncovering. And unmasking. It's a new kind of perception, a new kind of imagination. That's what goes on all throughout the apocalypse of John. He's just unveiling, uncovering. He's uncovering empire, which claims to be something else. He uncovers it as what? A beast. And covers the martyrs. The martyrs as those who are triumphant. The robes covered with blood but being white. He uncovers the slaughtered lamb. The slaughtered lamb is the one who reigns and is worshipped. It's that both and, both and. The same thing, I think, is going on in 1 Corinthians as Paul preaches with this kind of apocalyptic imagination. He's unveiling, he's uncovering God's hidden interruption of the old age, crucified. Messiah. Folly, that's wisdom. Weakness, that's power. To paraphrase uh, a contemporary poem, I think what Paul is doing is he's using words, we'll, we'll look at this poem tomorrow in the workshop, he's using words to reveal the cross that the cross itself obscures. Got that? I can't tell. I can't see anybody out there with this line. <laughs> <laughs> He's using words to try to reveal the reality of the cross that the crucifixion hides. That's apocalyptic imagination, a new kind of perception. Poets, I think, actually are often the agents of this kind of apocalyptic imagination, though they may not ever use that terminology. They often interrupt our normal ways of perceiving. And they help us see the world in new, often surprising, and very unsettling ways. Read poetry. If you don't do anything else, read poetry. It's important. Paul, however, doesn't choose the poet as the agent of apocalyptic imagination in the text we read. He chooses a different figure as the image of the creature. Maybe some of you have felt this way. The figure he chooses is the fool. The fool. The very places, it's fascinating, the very places here in which Paul interrupts the old age and invites us to new perception and new discernment, he not only speaks of the gospel as foolishness, but he himself adopts the role of the fool. We have become fools for the sake of Christ, he writes. And I think Paul's choice of the fool is no accident. The figure of the fool in his time and ever since actually provides a perfect lens for thinking about preaching and the apocalyptic imagination. Paul invites us to take seriously the various traditions of the fool, whether it be the fool in the theater or the jester in the court, whether it be the trickster who appears in cultures around the world or the holy fools in our Christian tradition. This evening, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about fools. Aren't you excited? Uh, uh, and try to make these connections between this figure of the fool that Paul draws on and the apocalyptic imagination. And then tomorrow in the workshop, we'll try to get a little more concrete with this. Um, three things. Fools interrupt. It's what they do. They interrupt. Secondly, fools are agents of 
perception. You don't often think of them this way, but I'll talk about that. And finally, the rhetoric of the fool. I'm going to try to spell this out in a minute. Go out on a limb with it. The rhetoric of the fool lies at the very heart of the proclamation of the gospel, particularly through an apocalyptic imagination. So first of all, <laughs> fools interrupt. That's what they do. They interrupt. Are taken for granted myths and rationalities and presuppositions which so often hold us captive and keep us from life. At the deepest level, fools do not simply seek to entertain or be funny, but often they do work through these means. Rather, they seek to interrupt business as usual. As Enid Welf, El Welsford has written in really a classic study of a fool's entitled, not surprisingly, The Fool. <laughs> Enid Welf El Welsford says, fools melt the solidity of the world. And maybe my favorite comment about fools. Fools melt the solidity of the world. They interrupt the truths and the assumptions that are supposedly written in stone. As the theologian Conrad Heyers has described the role of the fool, I quote, the fool confuses and garbles patterns of rationality and value and order by which we value and solidify experience. Sense is turned into nonsense, order into disarray. The unquestionable into the doubtful. The fool does not fit into, and he refuses to fit into the sacred conventions and hallowed structures of the human world. Everything comes out wrong. The speech, the logic, the gestures, the gestures, the decorum. Yet in this wrongness is rightness of another sort. In this foolishness is another level. Of wisdom. Sounds like Paul. Foolishness is wisdom, and wisdom is foolishness. Weakness is power, and power is weakness. And even he says, foolishness is power, crucified Messiah. Paul intentionally and specifically adopts and enacts the role of the fool. It's the appropriate role for him at the juncture of the ages. As Paul writes, we have become a spectacle to the world, a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ. The Greek word translated spectacle, which is placed parallel to fools, is theatron. Theatron, which means a theater act. Paul declares that in preaching the cross, he plays a role similar to the spectacle enacted by the fool in the Roman theater. As is the case in later theatrical forms through the centuries in the Roman theater, the fool is a lower class buffoon who is identified with the poor and engages in transgressive, disruptive behavior. He mocks the words and deeds, the serious and honorable characters. He or she resists those in privilege and those with authority, they give voice to what no one else dares to say. And trust me, no one else would ever say crucified Messiah. As a result of this disruptive behavior, the fool often suffers, as Paul did, both verbal and physical abuse. That's the way Paul assumes, takes it on himself. I think he should be imagined as a theatrical fool dashing unexpectedly onto the stage, disrupting the entire play with his shocking words and antics. Like the theatrical fool, Paul engages in transgressive behavior and speech through the proclamation of the cross. He disrupts the world's understandings of power and wisdom. He interrupts all the serious and honorable characters on the world's stage. He says things no one else dares to say. He proclaims a foolish 
gospel, a mad gospel, a moronic gospel. The crucified Christ is the wisdom and power of God. Indeed, by depicting God on the cross, Paul engages in the most extreme form of folly imaginable. He proclaims a paradoxical, even blasphemous word in mind-boggling, mind-boggling transgressive speech. As L.L. Welber, who has written a lot on Paul and the fool, drawing some of his work, Welber writes, Paul proclaims that the gallows bird embodies the divine. Fools interrupt. And Paul himself takes on and plays this disruptive role. The second, as I suggested, fools interrupt with a purpose. It's not just to have fun and irritate people. It can be fun and irritate people. But that's not the purpose. At the deepest level, at the deepest level, fools interrupt in order to change perspective. They interrupt in order to create a space where the new might break in, where new ways of perceiving and living might happen. They interrupt in order to reframe, reframe reality, in order to open up the possibility for another level of wisdom and another way of life. They seek to change the world by first changing our perception of the world. Jesters, for example, or jesters, are often paired with persons in power, whether kings or emperors, or yes, archbishops had jesters, and yes, professors had jesters. Some of you may want to consider that role with some of your professors. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but literally, professors, professors had jesters who would go on and keep them from taking themselves too seriously uh, and interrupt their vision, trying to give them a new perception. They interrupted that vision, the assumptions of those in power, the fools did. And usually they did so on behalf of the common people, the people who were on the margins, the people who had no access to those in power. And in interrupting and trying to change perception, they challenged the powerful people to see the world differently and to exercise their power differently. Indeed, one scholar has even suggested that court gestures were often physically different, physically different from others, for precisely this reason. A jester, as I'm sure many of you know, might be a short person or a hunchback person, but this was not simply for the purpose of entertainment or ridicule, although that did happen. Rather, such people physically embody a different perspective on the world. A short person sees the world differently from someone who is tall. The person who is much fat perceives the world differently from someone who is not. So in the core, such people actually physically embody the central purpose of the fool, to interrupt in order to challenge and reframe perspective. Holy fools do the same thing. Long tradition holy fools in the church. They interrupted in order to change perception. As Wendy Wright has described it, holy fools are persons who for the sake of the gospel appear quite insane or bizarrely eccentric to the point of lunacy, idiocy, or foolery. Holy foolishness is taken on a wide variety of forms. Uh, most prevalent in the Orthodox tradition, Russian Orthodoxy especially, Greek Orthodoxy, um, but, but also uh, in some Western traditions. Uh, St. Francis being one of the ones who's most often talked about as a fool. But they took many different forms. Some holy fools wandered in the streets like madmen or mad women. Others have appeared as antisocial eccentrics or even as simple minded. Others as jesters. Some pleasant, some very unpleasant. Many of them went around, around unclean, even unclothed. Some wore chains or iron collars, they engaged in all kinds of bizarre and even offensive behavior. Interestingly, throughout church history, these characters come along, seem to, when the church has grown complacent, or when the church has accommodated itself too fully to the culture. And in those contexts, holy fools 
interrupt presuppositions, the assumptions that can stifle the life of God's people. And through their scandalous gospel, they seek to change perception. With their crazy and at times obscene antics, the holy fools, as one scholar has put it, provoked people to learn to look. It's a burden to look. Their words and deeds challenge people to discern the gospel within the scandal. The holiness within the foolishness, bifocal vision. Their antics were carefully staged to provoke a kind of looking, the way of seeing and perceiving. Like Paul, holy fools created a crisis of recognition. Crisis of recognition. And usually, like Paul, they were abused and ridiculed because most people never discern the holiness within the madness. Others, however, did discern the gospel within the scandal, and they were converted and edified. The holy fools interrupted business as usual with a scandalous gospel. And they provoke people to look, to perceive in new ways. In plain fool, Paul likewise seeks to change our perception of the world. Paul, as I noted a few minutes ago, took up the role of the theatrical fool. And in taking on this role, Paul actually invites people to a new kind of perception. It's all there in the language of that sentence. Theaton, which I mentioned a minute ago. Theaton is a cognate of the word theonomy, which means to see, to look at, to behold. Theaton involves a kind of attentive looking or beholding, as the English word spectacle actually suggests. As the foolish theater act, Paul invites an attentive looking, just as the audience in the theater must attend to the spectacle of the play. He invites people to perceive with a biblical vision, to perceive in his folly, in his foolish words, the inbreaking of the new age, the wisdom, and the power of God. As a spectacle, that is, Paul interrupts in order to facilitate a new and different perception. In his letter to the Corinthians, as the New Testament scholar Alexander Brown notes, Paul seeks a perceptual transformation among his hearers. He seeks to move them, to move them in this liminal space from the perspective of the old age, in which the cross is a symbol of suffering, weakness, folly, death, to the perspective of the new creation, in which the cross is a transforming symbol of power and life. Through this disruptive preaching, Paul intentionally, and don't often think about preaching doing this, Paul intentionally leaves his hearers perceptually unbalanced. He places believers in an unsettled space, on the threshold between the old age and the new, where they might move, even if at times uncertainly, from one perspective to another. That's the work of apocalyptic imagination in preaching. So Paul takes up the role of the fool in interrupting the old age and seeking to change perception. As he himself affirms, preaching is foolishness. It's the work of the fool. Finally, the third, Paul's rhetoric. Paul's rhetoric. Tomorrow in the workshop, we'll look at a lot of this uh, shape of some of the rhetoric of the fool. Paul's rhetoric is the rhetoric of the fool. His language is disruptive and transgressive. As has already been suggested, his rhetoric is shaped by shocking, unsettling paradoxes. Foolishness is wisdom, wisdom is foolishness. Weakness is power, power is weakness. Foolishness is power, who's the time to Oh, those, I have nightmares at times, I have to say. I have nightmares at times when I want to have a sermon conference with the Apostle Paul. I mean, can you imagine? Because my tendency is, Paul, can't you go down a little clearer? You're probably going to confuse some of the weaknesses, but I will get you going to say, that's the point. That's the point. To interrupt, to create a space with this rhetoric, which is crazy, nonsensical, disoriented. He takes common assumptions and subverts them by holding together 
these unconventional and destabilizing pairs of opposites. That's the words of Alexander Graham. Unconventional and destabilizing pairs of opposites. Speech is like that of a medieval carnival play. It's rife with reversals and inversions, in which, as someone has put it, a dizzying series of positions relativize and compromise one another in quick succession. It's as if it's as if you listen to Paul in these texts and you're standing in the middle of one of those carnival houses of mirrors. You know what I'm talking about? Everything is disoriented, off balance. It's not easy to discern what is true, what is illusion. We could, we could examine many rhetorical forms that Paul uses from irony, sarcasm, to hyperbole, and parody, all of them the rhetoric of the fool. This evening, however, I want to suggest, and here's where I'm getting ready to go out on now. I haven't sort of said this publicly yet, but I'm going to try. Yes, you may laugh, you may throw tomatoes, you may do all kinds of things, it's fine. Uh, but tonight I'm going, I want to suggest that one classic rhetorical trick of the fool, and I'm going to call ironic literalism, actually lies at the very heart of the gospel itself and at the heart of Paul's proclamation of the gospel. So I'm going to look for just a minute, a little more closely at the cultural context of crucifixion and then try to set out how I think that this rhetorical move of the fool actually is at the heart of the gospel. According to New Testament scholar Joel Marcus, crucifixion was intentionally a parody. A parody was a form of what he calls parodic exaltation. Parodic exaltation. Crucifixion occurred, as I'm sure most of you know, in a culture that was fixated on matters of hierarchical rank. The wealthy and the powerful elites were considered to be high, that was the fundamental metaphor, they were considered to be high. The poor, the slaves, the marginalized were viewed as low. Even Paul will speak of those who are low and despised. Maintaining those hierarchical rankings, along with the honor and shame associated with them, was central to the ordering of the culture. If the low and despised overstepped their bounds and got above themselves, crucifixion became the appropriate punishment. For crucifixion intentionally served as a grotesque parody of this inappropriate breach of the hierarchy by those such as rebellious slaves who would not stay in their place. Here's what happened. You know what happens in crucifixion? The crucified one is what? Lifted up. Lifted up on the cross. It's a form of mocking exaltation. In this way, crucifixion unmasks in a deliberately grotesque manner the pretension and the arrogance of those who dare to raise themselves above their station. Crucifixion mocks the victim's pretension by raising them up and fixing them in this torturously elevated state until they die, driving the last nail, and a pun is actually appropriate here, driving the last nail into their lofty pretensions. The parodic raising up of the crucified was actually the intention of crucifixion. That's why they were lifted up, as Marcus writes. The cross was designed to mimic, parody, and puncture the pretensions of insubordinate transgressors by displaying a deliberately horrible mirror of their self-elevation. As a form of parodic exaltation, this will make it a little more concrete, crucifixion was often linked, often linked with a kind of mock kingship. The common understanding of crucifixion was enthronement. It was part of the joke. We actually do have crucifixion joke books. I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is part of it. Crucifixion was understood as enthronement, and the connection between the raising up of the crucified and the raising up of the king made for a good laugh. Mocking the crucified as a kind of royal figure was often part of the crucifixion itself. 
Jesus himself, you remember the story, Jesus was mocked by the soldiers as a king. They put a robe on him, a crown, the thorns on him. They saluted him, hail king of the Jews. They knelt down in homage to him. At the cross, a sign was placed above his head, reading, king of the Jews. While on the cross, Jesus was mocked by the passers-by, as well as by the religious leaders. Let the Messiah, the king of Israel, come down from the cross now, so we may see and believe. Such mockery was not only directly related to the charge against Jesus, it was intrinsic to the act of crucifixion itself. The mocking crowd enacted the gallows humor. They were part of the public performance. The soldiers and the crowds all participated in this kind of carnivalesque parody. That's the context of Jesus' crucifixion. However, working with bifocal vision, a different way of discerning, the New Testament writers proclaim that Jesus' crucifixion interrupts the parodic exaltation. And they call people to discern something more, something different happening on this cross. They invite us to discern the cross that the cross obscures. Moreover, now get to the good stuff. Jesus' crucifixion interrupts the, this parodic exaltation not with an act of worldly power, but in the way of the fool. That is, with irony. The parody of the mock enthronement intrinsic to crucifixion is itself ironically mocked. The one who is parodied as king of the Jews in his crucifixion is, according to the New Testament witness, in fact, the royal figure. And his crucifixion, ironically, is his enthronement. While the degrading death of crucifixion seems to be the decisive contradiction of the claim that Jesus is king, indeed a mockery and intentional parody of that claim, the opposite is in fact true. Jesus' crucifixion is his coronation. The low and despised one actually reigns. For those who discern with apocalyptic imagination, the real joke is on the powers of this age who mocked and crucified Jesus, but who have unwittingly become participants in his enthronement. Foolishness is wisdom. Weakness is power. Now all of that, not all that unusual. Here's what I want to argue that at the heart of this proclamation of the cross is a classic rhetorical trick of the fool. Ironic literalism. And I want, to, I want to claim this evening that the whole gospel turns on this rhetorical trick of the fool. Let me explain what I mean by ironic literalism. Through ironic literalism, the fool, a gesture, for example, adheres to the letter of a statement, but ignores the spirit. Adheres to the letter, but ignores the spirit of the statement. And by taking the words literally, the fool actually turns the intended meaning on its head. The meaning can even become the opposite of what was intended. Fools engage in this rhetorical maneuver all the time. One of the masters of ironic literalism was the German jester, trickster Theo Eulenspiegel. Time and again in the Eulenspiegel tales, as numerous scholars have noted, Eulenspiegel's tricks simply involve taking language literally when other people were using it figuratively or idiomatically. Even Goethe noted this characteristic of the tales. Goethe wrote, all the chief jests of the book depend on this. That everybody speaks figuratively, and Eulenspiegel takes it literally. Here's just one example. A king once rewarded Eulenspiegel for a trick by telling him that he could go out, take his horse, and get the very best horseshoes. So, Eulenspiegel went to the goldsmith, and he had his horse shod with gold shoes and silver nails. Must 
been quite a sight. Well, as you can imagine, it was also quite expensive. And the king was shocked and angry. He objected. Well, the Jamigal replied, Sir, you said that I was to get the very best portions. And I just took you at your word. Now, maybe an old German trickster is not exactly what you're interested in. So how about Amelia Bedelia? You know Amelia Bedelia? <laughs> Let's talk about Amelia Bedelia. You didn't expect to hear about Amelia Bedelia tonight. Did anybody expect to hear about Amelia? No, you didn't. Well, a few weeks ago, if you don't, I'll try to explain who Amelia Bedelia is. A few weeks ago, actually some former students of mine pointed me to these children's stories about Amelia Bedelia. Um, She's a housekeeper for a very wealthy family, and she does exactly what Eulenspiegel Spiegel does. She always takes their figurative language literally, and it upsets everything. So, for example, they tell her to dust the table. So what does she do? She goes and gets a lot of powder and puts dust all over the table. She said, well, if you wanted me to, dust, to do what you're saying, you should say undust the table. <laughs> and they tell her to draw the drapes. So she goes and gets her sketch pad, of course. You got it? That's, that's ironic liberalism, okay? Now we don't normally, that's, I'm going to admit it, we don't normally connect the gospel, the heart of the gospel, to oil and spiegel or Amelia Bedelia. You feel that that's kind of an apocalyptic interruption there? To do that? Maybe? Maybe not. Okay. But this rhetorical move, is precisely what shapes Paul's proclamation of the cross and the proclamation of the New Testament. The empire intends the crucifixion to be a parody of exaltation, a parody of power and wisdom. But Paul <coughs> makes the parody literally. And the meaning of the cross becomes the opposite of what the empire intended. The parodic crucifixion of the empire proclaimed in a figurative way through parody that Jesus was not in any way a royal figure worthy of enthronement. No one shame on the cross could be such a figure. It was impossible. Paul, however, like the gospel writers, takes the parody of exaltation literally and proclaims that Jesus' crucifixion is in fact the wisdom and the power of God. Paul actually takes this literalism to the extreme, to even blasphemous limits. The crucified one, he proclaims, is the Lord of glory. Paul thus seeks to, Paul thus interrupts, he seeks to change perspective, and he does it by using the rhetoric of the fool, apocalyptic imagination. So I'm just going to briefly pull all this together and then I'll be done. Preaching with apocalyptic imagination, and again, we're going to talk about this more concretely tomorrow, is the work of a fool. Such preaching, first of all, interrupts. Interrupts. You've got to think about that in our preaching. Interrupts. It employs rhetoric that disrupts the myths and conventions and rationalities of the old age, which are holding people captive and leading to death. Such preaching engages in creative resistance. Creative resistance. That's why the fool is so interesting. Not violent resistance, but creative resistance. To the principalities and the powers that hold people captive and often prevent them from even imagining alternatives to the ways of the world. When we're that captive, they need the interruption. Second, through these Interruptions. Preaching with apocalyptic imagination creates an unsettled liminal space in which people may move, may move, and always keep moving from the old age to the new. Preaching with apocalyptic imagination does not shut down or tie up or close off, but it rather instigates and sustains that threshold space, that threshold space between the ages, where we're in the tension between the old age and the new. Such preaching seeks to keep believers on the way, on the way. Third, this kind of preaching is concerned with perception and discernment. That should be clear right now. The preaching
Peter, I think, like a fool, is an apocalyptic figure who simply seeks to uncover, unveil, unmask the deadly ways of the old age and to unveil, uncover, unmask the inbreaking new creation all at the same time. God has already invaded and changed the world through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apocalyptic imagination simply seeks to create space where new perception becomes possible. Finally, I think such preaching does not take itself too seriously. It's content with the role of the fool, the role of the lower class buffoon, the ridiculous ridicule character of the drama who can always be dismissed as a moral. <laughs> For apocalyptic imagination is always, always a gift of the Spirit. That's why Paul will speak of the Spirit as primary gift as discernment. It's apocalyptic discernment. No eloquent words of wisdom can give the mind of Christ, but only the power of the cross through the movement of the Spirit. So, we preachers can be content to play the fool and proclaim this odd, disruptive, apocalyptic promise. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. What happens next is left to God. Thank you.